Hey, good evening. So good to see everybody tonight. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, good to see all of those of you online as well. Uh, thank you for joining us online. And those of you who are joining us not live online, we welcome you. Glad you could tune in and watch our service tonight. Pastor Mike Butler is going to be sharing a message with us tonight, so we are excited about that. Let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you this evening, God, and first and foremost, we give you thanks. We thank you for everything you've blessed us with, God, the little things, the big things, the things that we don't often thank you for. We're so thankful tonight, God. Thank you for salvation, Lord, for forgiveness, for wiping our slate clean, Lord, and giving us a new life. We are so thankful tonight. And God, as we open up your word, as we uh, hear what you've uh, given Pastor Mike to say, God, we pray that you would work in each of our hearts, God, that you would speak to each of us individually, show us something, teach us something, encourage us in some way. We pray that our hearts would be open tonight to hear your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Hope everybody's surviving COVID. So I have to teach class. I have to teach a lesson for a class. This is my first preaching class. And it's going to be a particular format. So I hope that y'all can follow with me, that I don't trip over my feet and sound like a big dumb doo-doo. <laughs> so, let me tell you a little something about me. I come from an extremely prideful, arrogant family. I am just like my mother and my grandmother. I struggle with it a lot, especially as a believer, because I know that we're not supposed to. I often judge by appearance... One of the things that really bothers me is excessive facial piercings, face tattoos. PJs in public just set my teeth on edge. It drives me bananas. And I try not to have any impression on my face when I come in a room and somebody's dressed like that. But I wonder if I'm a bit like my mom and it shows on my face anyway. I think my kids have a real hard time with it because sometimes they think I'm really upset with them and I'm not, and I'm really just trying to shove something down that may or may not have anything to do with them. This week, as I read in Luke chapter seven, verses 36 through 50, I find myself in this telling of Jesus' visit with Simon the Pharisee. I walk through church and Walmart and other public papers, places, and I think that I'm controlling my emotions. But I wonder if my emotion still displays on my face. I know I judge things similar to my family. I think it's generational. I wonder, does every family have struggles with this? I wonder if we are critical on the same issues or different issues. I work with the public, and I get to spend anywhere from a half an hour to several hours with people. I'm beginning to think we struggle with ju judgment and pride, all of us, but just in different areas. It's a universal problem. It's been happening since the beginning of time. Let's look together in God's word and see what Jesus does when he meets the woman of sin. I will be reading today from the NIV. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 37 and we're going to read through verse 50. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Is the next one there? Oh, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And when she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, 
and pour perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she was, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Jesus does this a lot. He likes to tell in stories, doesn't he? Simon says, teacher, tell me. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now Jesus says, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came to your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved, you went a little too fast, Andy, uh, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, now go in peace. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and they were reclining at the table. A woman who lived in that town learned that he was there. I lost my pace. All right. So Jesus has been invited in verse 39 through 38. Jesus has been invited to Simon the Pharisee's house, and they're chilling. And when a woman comes in carrying this alabaster jar, and she's crying. I mean, she's not just crying a little. She's crying enough that if she kneels in front of Jesus, she can wipe her tears with her hair. There have been many times in my life, especially when we were struggling with infertility, that I have been in so much anguish that I had gone to Jesus and fallen on my knees just weeping. I bet tonight I'm not the only one in this room that has gone to Jesus falling on their knees and weeping. It's an emotional place to be, and this is the best place to be, because subconsciously we completely submit ourselves to Christ. This is where the woman is. She is so distraught over her sin. Maybe she's used up all her willpower trying to live right, but has failed. But at this point, she is just so distraught. All she can think about is being with Jesus. Guys, this is where Jesus can really work with us. When we are so focused and so humbled and so distraught with our ickiness, that we fall on our knees before him. Verses 39, when Jesus, who invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him, what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. I think Simon is thinking truly in his head that if he knew who she was, if he was really the Messiah, he would know the true nature of this woman. This is where I fail. I assume that I know the hearts 
a people. That I can read minds. I assume that if someone looks different in the norm, that they must be sinners. Jesus shows who he is by asking Simon. He says, I have something to say to you. This is where Jesus tells his story. There was a money lender who forgives two borrowers, one owing 500 denarii and the other 50. Now who loves him more? Simon answers the, correction, the, the, the question correctly the one with the bigger debt. And Jesus says, Simon, you have answered correctly. Now this is the climax of the story, folks. The, sto the story where this woman of sin is the borrower. She owes the most. Her weeping over Jesus' feet is her gratitude. Jesus looks at the woman and explains to Simon that since she was here, he has washed his feet, kissed him, and anointed him with oil. Therefore, I tell you, your sins are forgiven. You see, in Jewish custom, we read about this in here, that when a guest is invited to dinner at someone's house, that traditionally they wash their feet and they kiss them, welcoming them into their house. But Simon didn't do this. Okay? We also find out that, that Simon isn't alone. And they question Jesus' authority to forgive her sins. There have been many times in my life when I have been in so much anguish. Oh, that's the wrong page. Sorry. Oops. According to the custom of the day, the guest was invited in your home and watched the dust of the road off their feet, kissed and rubbed oil into their hands, and Simon skipped all those traditions. But the woman has not ceased to attend Jesus. Jesus shows, or is trying to show Simon, the parallel between what's going on between him and the woman and the story of the moneylender. Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who forgives even sins? This is the first time that we see that Jesus was not Simon's only guest. Who are the other guests? We can only guess. They don't tell us who they are. We would think that if they were the other apostles, that they wouldn't be shocked at this point what Jesus does. But these guys are shocked, and they say they are surprised that Jesus forgives sins. If they were the other disciples, one would think that they wouldn't be surprised. Were they Simon's contemporaries? Were they other Pharisees? Was Jesus originally invited there to judge his doctrine? Jesus says to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Look at this passage from Proverbs 22, verse 4. The payoff for meekness and fear of God is plenty, honor, and and a satisfying life. The NIV says, Humility and fear of the Lord brings wealth and honor and life. From the Old Testament to the New, what God honors is humility. The woman of sin is broken, facing her Messiah, a more emotions pouring down her face, bowing before the king himself, whereas Simon is questioning his right to forgive sin. 
I think that Jesus, that Simon is questioning Jesus' right to the throne. Is he truly the Messiah? Why does he have the right to forgive sin? I think this story has a couple of really important points. The first one is that the woman shows that humility and loss of pride is what Jesus is looking for. And Simon, the Pharisee, is here to question Jesus' teachings. We need to focus on our lives and ourselves and our heart. We have to stop focusing on others. I do it myself. Somebody comes into church who doesn't quite look the way I think that they should look, and I'm not rude. I may smile. I may say, nice to see you. But I don't really talk to them. I kind of just move on to the next person. And I can't be the only one who does this. I can't be. It's easy once we are saved to stop thinking about ourselves. It's easy to have the mindset that we're good now. We're saved. We don't need to do anything more. It is not our place to judge a person approaching the throne of God. Anyone who attempts this should fear for their immortal soul. We serve the Lord because of his incredible mercy. Not because we are sinless. Shall we deny someone else from receiving that same mercy? Once we are saved, we no longer need a Savior. So now we can turn our intentions to others and work on saving the world. Our relationship with Christ should grow in such a way that we continue to see the need, our need for Christ. Daily, we should go and sit at his feet, washing his feet with our tears, especially us, because we know what he's done for us. It shouldn't end. We shouldn't think that we're good now. We shouldn't think, well, at least I'm not unsaved. At least I'm not living with my partner in sin. At least I'm not like one of those homosexuals. Every single day, we need to go before him and thank him for his mercy because without him, we could be just like the rest of the world. We're going to pray a moment and then Josh is going to come in and he's going to sing us a song. Heavenly Father, Help us to remember and to never forget what you've done for us, your incredible mercy. Help us to continue to see our need for you. Help us to not grow so prideful that we don't go continually before your throne room before your feet. Even as we grow in knowledge of your help, help us to not become prideful and lose sight of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If we really kept our eyes on him, 
What would it look like if we stopped getting consumed with the business of life and the business of church and became consumed with our relationship with Jesus? How would we treat others if we were consumed by God's love for us? How long has it been in the midst of this mess and chaos of COVID-19 since we invited somebody over and before they left, we tried to meet a need? A tank of gas, a loaf of bread. Whatever it is. Say this with me today. As we go into the world this week, Lord, take our eyes off ourselves and how far we've come. Instead, let us focus on humility and let his mercy instead drive us to reach out to others in his insatiable mercy. Thank you, guys. A lot of good stuff. You know, I, uh, I've heard that song. Uh, never knew the title, but uh, the title of the song is Give Me Your Eyes. I got that right. Give Me Your Eyes. I think I got that right. And, you know, I was just thinking about that along with your message. You know, that's... Uh, Pretty much, that the song title pretty much describes the call of God for our lives in a practical sense, you know, in a practical sense. Give me your eyes. Give me the eyes of Jesus, you know, that, you know, when I think about, you know, what we're called to do as, as uh, Christians, it's to go out and about and have the eyes of Jesus, essentially. Have the eyes of Jesus. See people the way that, that he sees them. See people the way that he wants us to see them. Give me your eyes. I've heard that song, but I never knew the title. Now, give me your eyes. That's, uh, I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I'm going to do just a little bit of discussion if we want to fire up a microphone. Oh, we're ready to go. And, you know, those of you joining online, feel free to uh, join in in our discussion, like always. Uh, just leave a comment online, and uh, you can, we can read your comment out loud here. But, uh, you know, what does that look like in your life? Talking about... The prayer, God, give me your eyes. Jesus, give me your eyes. What? Do you have a story you'd like to share? Do you have an example of that in your own life? I'd love to hear from you. I'll give you a minute to think about it, but give me your eyes. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like in your day-to-day -day life? Do you have a story? Do you have a time when... Um, Maybe you saw somebody a little bit differently, the way God would want you to see them, instead of just the way that we normally see people. Um, I don't know, I just throw it out there. Does anyone have a story or something they'd like to share regarding that? Give me your eyes. I'll give you just a, a minute to think about it. I know there's some stories brewing. I know somebody's got something. Amen. <laughs> it's difficult to think about because as a child growing up, I was one of those different people. As a minority, I wasn't accepted. I was called all kinds of names. And even when my father would try and do nice things for us, like get us all into the station wagon and drive to the beach, others had things to say. Like one child asked me, how come your hands aren't black like the rest of you? And how come the bottom of your feet aren't black like the rest of you? Mm. So I've always had to see things differently, I guess. And maybe it's because of the way my parents raised me that I had to look with eyes like Jesus. I couldn't see them as they were negative and prejudiced and so on, I had to see them as another child of God. So it's something that I've had to grow up with. And so I see the things that Pastor Mike talked about, like people in pajamas, 
I think it's crazy. But I also have to think to myself, maybe that's all they have to wear. Maybe they don't have jeans. Maybe they don't have nice pants or dresses. So I try to always reason as to why they look the way they look. Uh, whether that's always seeing them the way Jesus sees them, I'm not sure. But that's why I try to see things differently. Oh, thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. I think we have somebody back there. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, something that I recall, but it was during the time in my early 20s working in retail on commission. And uh, when you're in an environment of such, you're programmed to quickly uh, assess people by demeanor, by status of certain items to assume that this is a good catch, if you will, to make your commission for that day. But I never really was that individual. So I never really made my goals. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> um, and one day a gentleman came in. Um, his hair was very damp. He had sweats on, holes in them. And immediately everyone shunned him. And I saw everyone walk away from him, and I could tell that he felt it. And knowing that I'm not going to make my goals anyway, I just felt, and this is prior to having Jesus, but I felt the need to approach him anyway and just say, hey, what do you need? Is there anything I can maybe point you in a direction? And he said, sure, I just need some essentials. Um, I need everything, actually. I'm actually an attorney, and my home just burned down. And I felt like my heart broke because he himself was experiencing from eyes of probably on a good day, he wore his suits and his latest garments and was approached differently. But what that taught me just now in the eyes of God is when he says pray for your enemies, he almost positions your inner soul to become that mindset before you feel it. Um, it's a, I mean, he knows everything ahead of time, and he just directly gets to the source. He doesn't play games um, to really make the correction. And so when you take faith to look things outside of what they look like, what faith is, you know, you position yourself, one, to obey the word of God, and two, because he already knows these things, he gives us these direct demands to, and, and essential to not even waste time. And so uh, that was one of the things that hit me. And we had a long conversation. He was like, wow, I've never experienced this kind of service before. It was a high-end boutique. Um, and, uh, and I just never forgot that. You know. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for sharing. You know, and you mentioned that was uh, before you became a Christian, but I don't doubt that was you know, God working in your heart in that moment. And thank you for sharing. You know, uh, having worked at a restaurant you know, uh, for tips... It's so interesting, you know, some of the nicest dressed people uh, who appear very wealthy, who appear very generous, perhaps, maybe you have that preconceived notion, uh, actually did not tip as well as maybe somebody who you wouldn't think, just by looking at them, judging them, you know, you wouldn't think. Uh, some of the best tips I ever got were from people just uh, dressed very casually. Um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect it, but uh, yeah, you can't, thank you for sharing that, you can't necessarily judge people. You cannot judge people by what they're by what they're wearing, by the way they appear. That's that's a good that's a good theme. Um, do we have any online comments, by the way? Did you see anything? Oh, God, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just thinking about what the two ladies just were talking about, and one thing is one of my part-time jobs over the years was working in a high-end jewelry store, and um, I'll be honest with you, it was the people who didn't. It, it was the farmers who came in who had the the money, but a lot of people didn't even recognize it because they would ignore them. And I guess being a farm girl, I, maybe that's what helped me there. Um, I'd like to think it's because I had a Christian heart too. Uh, but that and the other thing that I think about, uh, just kind of whatever's popping in my mind here, but I think about when I see somebody in pajamas or I see somebody who looks like they haven't bathed for a week or I... I I say a prayer for them, and I make it a point, if I can at all, if, it, if God puts me in their path, to, to say hi, or if they want to talk a little bit, to talk with them. Because they're probably, 
it could be they've lost their job or they're suffering depression or I mean there could be a reason that they could be being lazy they could you know um, it it's so easy um, I guess for my mind too my mom's always saying don't judge somebody you don't know where they're coming from you don't know what they've been through and I think about that um, mm. in the strong Christian heart that she has as well oh wow thanks for sharing that's good amen when I was, oh, that was loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a brother, and he made decisions that made me think, why? Basically, growing up with him was trying to survive. And I'm not saying this in a way where he was rude or angry with me, but he always made it his goal to get into a fight with me. And my parents always knew that he would grow up and change. And looking back today, I, I knew it was going to happen. And when he was sent to prison, he finally looked to God again and he changed. And it became something that I couldn't even imagine possible when I was growing up with him. And seeing him now, it, well, well, from what I've heard from my mother when she emails him and talks to him, since tr with COVID he can only email, it's, he, he's, he's changed, he's a lot different, he he's, sounds like he's really changed and turned himself around, and something that I could learn to forgive what he did when I was growing up, tearing me down every day, but... With the, with the eyes of God, I finally see that he's grown up and realized that he's, he needs to apologize for what he's done, and I'm willing to forgive. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, so, I mean, to sum it up, yeah, I mean, you're, you're saying, like, God has given you the eyes to forgive. You know, part of having the eyes of God is forgiving. That's so huge. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, any online comments, by the way? Just curious. Okay, do we have a hand back here? Did I see a hand? Or are we all just stretching back there? No. no. Anyway, um, well, yeah, th and thank you for sharing. That's uh, that's so good, so insightful, and so encouraging. Tom, do you have something? I would not. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Just a, a couple of things that I learned through my life that changed my view more towards how Jesus would look at us, I think. Um, struggle with it all the time anyway, but at the same time, I always go back to, first of all, all sin in God's eyes is equal, right? I always learn that, yeah. you know, no matter what the sin is, it's, it's equal in his eyes. It's sin is a sin is a sin. But then when you look at, so when you look at yourself, I sin, and I, I can't judge anybody else for their sin as long as I've got sin in my life. But then the other thing that I learned that I always stuck with me was hate the sin, love the sinner. So when you look at it that way and you look at sin as equal, it's like I can't, I don't look at the sin. I just look at the person for who they are. And we're all different. We're all look different, have different things that we have, but God sees us all as his, as his creations and we have to love them the same. So you know when you when you when you put aside the the differences and all that, we're you know at the core, God made us all good, and we need to find that good. Yeah, yeah. We're all made in God's image, right? And He loves everybody. Yeah, so true. Yeah, that's such a such a challenge, you know, especially for me in particular, such a challenge to, you know, not not judge people. And, and I think it's like a, a lifelong thing that we really have to learn. You know, we're so in different areas, we're different ways, you know, we're quick to judge and oh, thanks for sharing that. Well, I'm gonna just uh move on real quick. There was something that you mentioned, uh, and the way you described it was an already saved mindset. Having an already saved mindset, you know, and this is so huge, and I think this is so central um, 
to uh, you know to the way God wants us to live. In that, uh, we 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 shouldn't we shouldn't have this mindset that says, "Well, I'm already saved, so I can just live however I want." I mean, that's you know that's kind of how the Pharisees lived in a way. You know, um, so you, so you mentioned it. You use the terminology "already saved" mindset, um, but in reality, you know, God wants us to have a mindset of growth, a mindset of sanctification, a mindset of growing in holiness, of growing closer to God. And we've hit on this before, but um, but maybe we can just talk about it for a minute. If anybody has something to share, you know, how do you combat this already saved mindset to where, um, and I don't want to discount the fact that we're saved. I mean, that's huge. You know, when we, uh, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that's that's huge, and that's a, a, a very significant spiritual milestone in our lives, and, and there's a lot of power with that. But at the same time, I do believe God has called us to continual growth and continual sanctification, um, and, I think that's, uh, and I think it's lifelong. You know, he's, he's calling us, regardless of how many years we've been in church, to continually grow and continually be open to him uh, sanctifying us and growing us. So tell me, what does that look like in your life? Um, what does that look like in your life? We, uh, you know, we saw some examples in Scripture uh, that that Mike read just a, just a bit ago. But you know, what, is, what does it look like in your life? And I, and we've kind of been talking about this stuff the last couple of weeks as we've talked about spiritual disciplines. You know, uh, kind of this idea that we're constantly, every day, supposed to be, every week, supposed to be. You know, having these rhythms, having these spiritual disciplines present in our lives. So, what does it look like in your life to combat against this already saved mindset and and be focused on the way that God wants you to grow? Any anybody want to share? Uh, anybody want to share the answer that you might have to that question? How does? Uh, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it all has to do with your heart. When you are saved, you're changed from the inside out, meaning your heart has changed. And I had to deal with this when I had to have open heart surgery mm. because I asked the Lord the question, okay, what is it that you need me to change? And he reminded me of many, many things. And you have to keep your heart in tune, kind of like when you have a car with a battery, every once in a while, it might need a charge. Mm. Well, our heart needs a charge. Yeah. Even though we are saved, we have to recharge it. That's a good analogy. And when you get closer to God through his word, he continuously changes your heart. And as your heart changes, then that wonderful change comes over the rest of you. So your eyes don't see things the way they used to. Your ears don't hear things the way they used to. And you can start being more like Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good stuff. Any, oh, go ahead, back, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I know for me in my life, um, we go to Proverbs 9, 10, um, the fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning of all knowledge or wisdom. Yeah. Um, and uh, we read Job. When Job questions God, he basically tells he basically tells him, "Who are you to ask me these questions? Well, you know, yeah. where were you when I you know created the universe?" Yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, when we understand who He is, we look at Isaiah six. He says, "I'm a dead man when He sees God." And yet, you know, he's fearful. There's this fear. Um, John the Revelator, when he sees Christ in all his glory, falls as a dead man. Um, but when we, when we understand this, we humble ourselves in that fear. That's what, as, as in James, it says, then he lifts us up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. In Isaiah 6, we see that after he feels like he's about to die, the angel comes up and cleanses the lips and purifies his sin. Um, and then the Revelator, John the Revelator, in, uh, in Revelations, after he falls dead, Christ puts his right hand on him and says, it's me, the first and the last. It gives him comfort. 
It's all in humility in knowing who God is and what he's done in you and through you. Um, it's the rechargement of understanding of your testimony within you. I came from dirt too. I have no right to judge these people around me. I need to be as humble as possible that I'm able to humbly come before them and love them as Christ would. And that's been my running juncture <laughs> of my life is understanding that fear, not so much of a way where I don't know he loves me, but so much that I know his power and I know his strength and I know all that he is because in those moments is when his love starts flooding in and that peace comes. So. Yeah, I, th I appreciate you using some of those different references. That's you know, that, that's powerful, you know, kind of looking at different parts of Scripture, kind of that idea of being broken down, you know, being broken down and, and humble, like you said, being humble to where God can lift you up and, and work in your life. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Um, anything online real quick? Or just, just a, oh, go ahead. Just saying, Melanie is saying she's loving this topic. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yes, likewise. Thanks, Melanie. Good to, good to see you on there. Uh, you know, real quick, uh, speaking of humility, real quick, uh, one thing, Last question, one thing, uh-oh, there it goes. Okay, one thing you mentioned is that Jesus is looking for humility. And, and we see it, of course, in the uh, story of the, you know, the woman uh, bowing before Jesus with the perfume and whatnot. Uh, Jesus is looking for humility. You know, and so just this, this theme of humility, this idea of humility that really in order you know, for God to work in our lives, we have to remain humble. We have to stay humble, remain humble. I know in my life I have days where I, where I feel sort of prideful uh, in a bad way. Do you ever have days like that where you're kind of mm -hmm. all up in your own head, you know, just uh, look what I did, you know. And, and, and it's not good because oftentimes God is quick to bring me down. God is quick to humble me in some way. Maybe you know, I see some nodding heads. Maybe you can relate, you know. Um, so this idea that, that Mike talked about, Jesus is looking for humility, uh, in other words, maybe um, we could look at it in terms of spiritual growth is kind of wrought about through humility in, in some sense. Um, so just any, any, any closing thoughts in regards to humility and how God has been producing that in your life? Just curious. Well, I just want to say that tonight has been really good for me because of the day that I had today and the stress and everything else that's um, gone on with me today and... and uh, Things that I did at work and so forth, I was, I, when I came to church tonight, I was stressed out, I was, and I kind of took it out on somebody, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I needed to hear this tonight, I needed to come back and, and realize, and it's just like what you said, you know, when God saw what I was, where I was at, and he needed, he knew that I needed this message. Oh. Thanks for sharing that. Amen. That's, I love it when God works like that. That's awesome. Thank you. Any closing thoughts regarding humility? Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Um, I guess regarding humility and also the pattern of the Lord, if you will, going back to the um, aspect of um, once saved and you don't have to do anything, um, but I think for all that he does, when you do come under the fear of the Lord, you naturally want to re just say thank you in whatever way. And any opportunity when you're in love with someone or you find that you're really grateful, you find any opportunity to return it in some way. And the least he asks us is just to be one with him, which is abide in him, know his mind, not just his hands, not just what he can do for us his mind, his spirit, his thought patterns. And uh, in that, if you look at nature, everything that he has multiplies. Everything that he does has growth in it and growth and growth and growth and more. You take a tree, there's one apple, and that apple, there's seven seeds, and each of those are trees that grow multiple apples. Like he's just a God of multiplication. And I think by nature, besides the aspect where he talked about the three tokens with the different guys that had, one had five tokens, one had ten, one had one. Um, he is looking for his kingdom to advance. 
yeah. and he talks about rewards and all these things that we don't even, I always ask the Lord, I said, Lord, why do you even need to give us rewards on top of this? <laughs> you know, and yeah. he, you know, I don't question him, but it's, it's delicious, his mindset. And, um, and, and, and this is where humbling before the Lord allows us to naturally um, receive people different, receive ourselves that we can grow and multiply and expand his kingdom. Amen. I love that knowledge of multiplication. Uh, of course, we also see, I just think of you know, the 12 disciples, you know, where he's essentially calling them to multiply, you know, and then, and then, and, and then when he talked about mindset, that made me think of the, the verse, uh, the, the renewing of the mind. And that's such a powerful verse, you know, that God literally, the Holy Spirit literally renews, changes, transforms, you know, our, our thought process. That's huge. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Do we have some? One specific day that gave me a lot of humility was Monday, specifically Monday. And I woke up knowing nothing could get in my way. I knew from yesterday, uh, well, from Monday's perspective, it was Sunday. The message that you gave Sunday gave me a lot of humility and made me wake up. And when I woke up Monday, I had a lot of humility and one special thing that I will never forget um, happened that day. I got to spend time with my father, something I haven't done in a while, and nothing was going to change that. And when I spent time with my father, I had a connection that I knew that was falling apart, and we finally got back together, and we are really rebuilding that strength. Awesome. And with, with God by my side, I knew that we can rebuild the relationship that was falling apart. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. No, oh, we got a, we got a comment back here. <laughs> and we have to use the mic that way. The online uh, it picks up online there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, going along with um, what what's it, what my sister said here, <laughs> Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> um, John seventeen. Humility. Um, it, at its finest. I want to read the prayer of Jesus. Um, as you said, we need to be one as he and the Father are one. Um, <laughs> being around people and being as close as the Father in Christ, we have to be, <laughs> we have to have humility. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but I like my time alone, um, you know, on my bed, chilling, I have five kids, so running away from kids for a little bit, you know. And, um, but, Amen. like, Christ deliberately wants us to be one so close as he and the Father are. He and the Father are one. Like, we can't even understand or fathom that. But that's how close he's prayed for us to be. So that is humiliating, to, uh, humi not humiliating, but uh, humbling to me yeah. because I can't be myself. Uh, you have to come to the, uh, the understanding of it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Um, and you have to come to that place. It's like John the Baptist. You know, uh, he, he must rise up while I humble myself down. Um, and, you know, being one is just probably the hardest thing we have <laughs> to do as people. And if, if we come under the fear of the Lord and we understand that together, then that's a possibility. But yeah. yet, it, it is the most humility humbling thing to do is to become one with those around you by discipling, by being with other people. Amen. Oh, that's good. Thanks for sharing. So true. Well, thank you guys. I think we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for everybody you shared. Anything online or... Yeah, thank you so much. That was a... That was good stuff. Um, Alita, would you like to close us in a word of prayer? These are words from a song called The Alabaster Box, which was part of Pastor Mike's message. The room grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbled through the tears that made her blind. She felt such pain. Some spoke in anger. She heard folks whisper, there's no place here for her kind. Still on she came, through the shame that flushed her face. 
until at last she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard. As she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. And I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. So don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. You weren't there the night he found me. You did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. It's a beautiful song, and I've sung it a few times. But you have to humble yourself to the point where nothing else gives you shame. You don't care what those around you are saying. You don't care how they look at you in disgust. You don't care that you know they're muttering and you can hear them because they don't whisper very well. And you still bow at Jesus' feet and say, Lord, I am yours. You made me. You know exactly who I am. I don't have to rely on others to define who I am because you've already defined me. I was made in your image and I am your creature whom you died for on the cross. Father, just forgive us for the many times that we look at others with judgment in our eyes or in our hearts. And we pray that this time, from the message we've heard and from the many chances that you have given us, that we will see others differently, that we will even see ourselves differently, because many times the biggest critic of ourselves is ourselves. So help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. You see a good person made in your image, covered by your blood. Help us as we grow in you to see ourselves the way you see us. And then we will be able to see others the same way.